coming up on UGTV. A special session of the Unified Government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas.
Good evening. I'm going to call our special session to order. I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. I'm going to ask the clerk to announce the meeting and call the roll. The special session is being held on Thursday, May 10th, 2018 at 545 Fifth Floor Conference Room for a presentation on Animal Services Facility um, study. Roll call. Mugia? Here. Johnson? Here. Kane? Here. Markley? Here. Walters? Here. Philbrook? Here. Bynum? Here. Burroughs? Here. Townsend? Here. McKiernan? Thank you. Tonight we have a special presentation from our uh, team looking at our animal services facility and I'm going to uh, hand it over to Administrator Doug Bach. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, last year the commission funded us to take a look at our animal services facility and look at what our future direction could be if we were to look at expanding services or exactly what we needed in order to provide some of the current services we have today. Um, so since that time, our team, team has been working on this. So we have our representatives here. That's Jennifer Stewart, who's our Director of Animal Services. Um, Representative Sab Sabini Architects, who worked with them as well. They were who we hired to bring in to help us do this study. And Chief Ziegler will be here momentarily. He's still wrapping a few things up from the uh, graduation downstairs. But at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer and let her to take the presentation. All right. Good evening. Um, I will we'll just get started here. So Animal Services was built in 1987, um, and this is our current building. I uh, included the dedication plaque that, uh, when it was built and got up and running. The Shelter was built, like I said, in 1987, and it was truly just built to for animal control. It was to control the animal population. Um, dogs and cats were brought in. They were held for a three-day holding period, and they were put down if they were not claimed by their owner. The uh, rate was approximately 70% for the euthanasia rate. And times have changed quite a bit, um, and the building is still serving a great purpose, um, but it's, it's becoming old, and um, we now have poor ventilation, disease is spreading through the animals, it's unpleasant. Um, the office space is, uh, this is a current office space that we have here, and many times officers have to share computers and desks just because we don't have enough space. Um, the list is extensive of shelter limitations, but these are challenges that we face every single day. Um, this is our lobby space here. So this is where you go in and you go out. So if you are bringing in an animal that you found as a stray and we are trying to take an animal out that's just been adopted or returned to their owner, we often have to ask the owner of one of the owners to go outside and wait for our, us to finish our transaction. As you can see, uh, parking is severely limited. Um, the, there are two spaces after we get staff parked at 8 a.m. And a lot of times we are parking on the railroad uh, drive. So our current storage space is limited to a very small shelf. Our veterinary care room is very cramped, and sometimes we'll have a vet and a vet tech, and that's pretty much all that can fit in there. The laundry, surgery prep, food prep is all done in one very small room. We are often at capacity, sometimes over capacity, and um, there's minimal outdoor enrichment space. We do have three out outdoor kennels that we like to rotate animals, um, but not a lot of space for socializing and exercising, and definitely no space um, for adoptions. And that's that's super important as we try to get animals more home into more homes. So as I had mentioned, um, the poor ventilation, um, as I showed in a previous slide, and what happens is that ventilation, even though we have a new HVAC system, we still have some 
um, parts of the old system, and that's just filtering contaminated air throughout um, the kennels and into the office space. Um, so disease is, it's especially in the warmer months, it spreads pretty quickly. Um, and just the smell. Uh, we do a really good job of cleaning, and uh, I have a new staff member that does a great job, but we just, with the ventilation, we just can't get rid of that smell. And I'm gonna give you just a, a quick example of um, the barking and the, the sounds that are often um, witnessed throughout the day. So that's every day. Um, it, it gets loud and it's, it's a stressor to the animals that are all in one big space and it's a stressor to um, staff as well. It's, it's just hard to work in an environment like that. So um, one of the great things about our shelter currently is that we are a no-kill uh, shelter and we have um, been a no-kill shelter since 2014. In early 2009, we established a relationship with the Humane Society of Greater Kansas City and PetSmart. And um, Humane Society and PetSmart both um, pulled animals, or currently do, uh, for adoptions. So we're getting some animals out. It took several years, uh, but we established no-kill shelter status in 2014 and continue to maintain that. Uh, right now we're at a 7.2 percent euthanasia rate and uh, you have to so no kill means less than 10 percent and the only time that we euthanize animals is for behavior or illness and, but we don't do it to make space and because of that we often have a full shelter So the community survey results in the overall satisfaction with uh, public safety. It is slowly improving. Um, looks like about 1% per year. Um, I know that the citizens' primary concerns are one, drugs, two, crime, and the third one being loose animals running around um, the community. Um, we have had a very low rating for a long time. I think that with uh, newer staff coming in, improved training, and just overall just importance in community service, uh, we should continue to improve as we go. Um, I think one of the things is um, animal services has a reputation for being dog jail and just it just it doesn't have a welcoming appearance and i think that also whether they've had an interaction with animal services or not just the image that is portrayed by the building that we currently have so just a quick overview of then um, back in 1987 until currently um, it was animal control and animals were euthanized rather quickly there was no animal enrichment or adoptions. Um, customer service wasn't that great. I had been on the receiving end of poor customer service and as a citizen, and I, I remember that. And I've really worked on stressing the importance of that to my staff. Um, and there is minimal community involvement. Um, now, we, the name has been changed to Animal Services. We have a no-kill status. We're doing adoptions at PetSmart on the weekends. We're also doing shelter adoptions as time and staff allow. Right now we're doing five to six a week, um, usually on Mondays, they're rollovers uh, from the weekend. I have expanded rescue partnerships to not only one, but I'm working with five or six different rescues right now. Um, like I said, community service, um, improved customer service and um, we're pretty low on our staffing um, our response time is not ideal but we're working on it um, we have I've hired a couple of new staff that should be up and running pretty soon and we also have an administrative staff member that we hadn't had for quite a while and that got another officer into the field um, 
again, um, it's uninviting, and no parking, and no real ad dedicated adoption space. Um, but we make do with what we have. Um, and we try to do the best that we can to improve the citizen satisfaction. So into the future, um, ideally we would microchip all pets upon intake, um, including having microchip clinics for community pets that does a couple of different things. It makes sure that we can reunite pet owner or pets with their owners and we can track habitual offenders that often let their animals run loose. Um, we just don't have the space right now to do a clinic that we could offer that service. Um, I would like to have a full, do full service adoption center in retail space. Generally, you adopt a puppy, you go to Walmart or PetSmart or somewhere, you buy a leash and a collar and a bed and toys. Those things could happen right at the shelter. Um, we get calls once or twice a week about cremation services for community pets, and we often have to send them to a different company that charges anywhere between $100 and $200 um, to, for cremation. Um, we don't really have the space for behavioral assessments, but that's something I would like to do, more community involvement, um, pet care, safety workshops, and a volunteer program. Uh, we have some volunteers, we just don't have a lot of space for volunteers to help us. Volunteers are free workers, and um, right now we just don't have the space to accommodate them. Um, ideally, we would have more staff if we had a bigger building, um, just because we would have more animals that we're taking in. And um, the intake projection is approximately 10% per year. I don't know for how many years that is projected. Um, Sabatini architects can discuss that. So those are just some things that I would like to see in the future that I think would help us build um, a better relationship with the community and offer um, more services that I think the community has come to expect. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dan and Laurel real quick. So one of the first things we need to think about when we're- I need you to turn your microphone on. Thank you. It's on. I need to get closer. Thank you. So one of the first things that we want to think about when looking at a new shelter facility is thinking about the size and the capacity for that facility, knowing what you have now. These are all of the items that we have to consider. It's um, a combination of what the county mandates are, what you are expecting to happen at this facility, um, what your requirements are, the animal history, and preferably we like to go back five years to determine that to get a good assessment. Um, the holding times, how long the animals, what their length of stay is at the facility, um, what those are now and what they could be in a new facility. Uh, the court holds, um, animals that are being held for evidence that may need to stay longer than a typical um, animal might. Uh, the peaks, there's certain times of the years where you're gonna have more cats or more dogs and taking that into consideration and it's different here versus in neighboring counties. Um, public programs, spay, neuter, vaccines, euthanasia, veterinary services, what which of these programs do you want to in include or not include at your facility? Um, those relationships that you have with other shelter and rescue operations in the area, and then the human demographic ratio. And so our recommendations are to increase the capacity that you have for dogs 30%, increase the capacity for cats 50%, um, increase the capacity for animal services in general, um, increase um, and provide more adequate office space, um, not only for the animal services part, but the animal control uh, functions, and add space for public programs and gathering space. So you can see down here, that's an existing shot of the existing cat um, area, which is used currently for adoptions, and this is a, it's a, what a potential could be for a new facility. Um, and then you're seeing the existing 
and new square footages um, and relationships between those. So the existing facility is um, almost 5,300 square feet, and we would be proposing um, 14,500 square feet um, of actual space with the gross at 18,821. Um, current dogs is 81, potential for 108 with even more with the flexibility designed in, you could have even more during seasonal peaks. Um, 40 current cats going to 61 with a total of um, current 121 animals moving to 169 animals. My name, <clears throat> I'm Dan Sabatini. And so when you, so this chart, to give you an understanding of give you a little bit of understanding of what we're looking at here is green and existing, the blue and new. Um, what you have currently, the, the first line is kind of a little bit confusing even to me. Um, the first line represents you have mostly kennels. You do not have isolation. So uh, kennels to adoption, even though those services are, are elsewhere, uh, the adoption is somewhat tucking in. You're doing some at the facility, but most is uh, offsite. So uh, with a third party. So what you're seeing is a flip of that is you're, you're doing a lot, which you'll be able to do is a lot more holding. Um, a lot of this um, uh, construction is very robust construction and we, uh, we, we try to, build, what we try to do is build in flexibility and I'll talk about that in the, on the cost side, but that, what that represents is, what, that flexibility is we try to compartmentalize so that isolation of diseases and isolations of, of even court holding uh, animals, you have flexibility to change the use in those particular areas and it's much smaller kennels. So um, what we're trying to do is in, increase the holding and isolation areas. The animal services, that's like everything from uh, washing dishes to washing, uh, um, to pr food prep, um, Clean, you know, uh, if you're washing animals, those kind of things can happen. Clinic, as we've talked about, you know, services, you know, actually providing a, a, a clinic that can support those services uh, as, as like spade and neat, um, um, neuter, yeah, spade and neuter. Intake, um, so increasing the intake side of, of things is is it's really a doubling of that area, but that area is also where we try to do is separate when people are either bringing back a dog or bringing in a stray, we try to keep that out of the adoption area because that, you, know, you could have a dog that doesn't get along with, and you don't really want that dog in the adoption area where you're trying to uh, bring, um, right, trying to really sell people on adopting those dogs. Um, so, we, we really do separate that. And the other, you can even separate it further where cats and dogs aren't quite the same uh, treated area. Office space, um, as we said, we're willfully uh, under, under um, we're cramped and tight in those. Common areas, the things that you, would, you could provide, and as we've talked about, training areas um, for outreach programs that help keep the dogs in the home, you know, if they have behavioral issues. Um, you know, you can do training programs that help people keep their dogs and uh, other animals in the home. And then just plain building support, support areas. Um, which was, yeah, sorry, I didn't see. Okay, so cost. Um, so this is kind of looking at a tooth, you know, somewhere in 2020. Um, not necessarily saying that's when you're gonna do this, but we had to pick a date. Um, for a 50-year building, this is a building that's robust. There's other ways to do buildings that aren't robust, but you have a lot of water, you have a lot of moisture in these buildings. So, as I said, you typically build these, uh, ideally you build these out of concrete block as for your wall structures, and you build the flexibility in, in, in to be able to move, to have different compartmentalization of, of animals. Um, so. You know, you can even, I mean, you can, you can do a lot. You can even, if, if you have um, areas for, for the cats to get to know um, kind of cat colony areas, they could, those things can transition to even just get to know places. So 
Um, the cost that you're seeing there is, like I say, is based on a 50-year life building or longer um, before you have to do things. Obviously, mechanical systems and stuff have a life life expectancy that's shorter. Um, but our construction costs at 2.5. What's in the soft cost is everything from, I mean, sorry, 6.5 construction costs. And the 1.9 is in that. You know, you have everything from caging cost, equipment cost for like clinic, you have fees, you'll have other services that go into that. Um, we've included the idea of a dog park associated with it. Again, trying to keep, do some outreach. Um, and then we tried to give you a sense of how those um, annualized uh, operational costs, depending on how you finance uh, a capital, uh, or capitalize the, the financing of this, it, it could represent a, a chunk, a, a chunk of money there. That and then the human resources is obviously kind of the biggest, one of the biggest costs. Um, and then the other is just supplies and, and other daily utilities and things that go into it. So building a robust uh, building is 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 kind of key to giving you know, a really long-lasting building. So I'll give it back to Jennifer. So as Dan mentioned, it's a pretty hefty sum of money, and I, I understand that. Um, I have just done some evaluations of revenue that currently comes in um, mostly from adoptions. And between PetSmart and the shelter, we did 586 adoptions last year and collected nearly 61,000 in fees. We transferred 1,276 animals to mostly one uh, rescue group. And um, so that was some lost revenue. We just didn't have the space to hold them and um, conduct adoptions. So, um, our current adoption fees are 62 for males, 72 for female dogs, and 35 for cats. Um, I did a study of Kansas City metropolitan areas um, and um, proposed a fee increase um, at some point. Um, the average is about 150 for dogs and 50 for cats and that includes a microchip, they are spare neutered, they're age appropriate vaccinations, and for a KCK resident that adopts an animal from Kansas City, Kansas Animal Services, a city license would be included in that just to maybe give them some incentive to adopt within the city that they live. So I will, I will mention here that of that 1,276 uh, animals that were transferred to another rescue, um, they charge a minimum of 150 up to $500, sometimes more, um, per animal. And so based on an average of $250 per animal, um, rescue groups um, generated nearly $320,000 in revenue. Um, this is an organization that's outside of our city and county. So there's a lot of money that is leaving this county that can stay here and we can adopt those animals out of here if we have the space. So based on last year's numbers of the 1,276 that were sent off plus our eight or 586, Based on the $150 and $50 um, dog and cat um, fees for adoptions, our potential adoption revenue is $202,000, about $203,000. Um, and with uh, retail space, just basic leashes, collars, um, kennels, um, the average is about $15,000. So it, it's a pretty big chunk of change compared to what um, we have right now. And I think that that would offset some of the cost. Um, and I think that with based on these numbers and the animals that we have brought in, um, 
it needs to be understood that we're turning away a lot of people every week um, because our shelter is full. So there are more animals out there that we can pick up, and I think that a lot of them are adoptable. And I think that these numbers could be a lot higher um, over time, but with that, we're gonna need the space to do that. That's all I've got. Thank you very much. So, uh, Mr. Bach, do you wanna make any further comments on the matter before we just ask the commissioners if there's any comments or questions from us? Well, I think as, as Jennifer and, and they went through this, anytime we get into studies like this, we have a likely anticipation of what the outcome could be. I mean, if and this was one, if we were, I guess we look at it from perspective, if we did this right and we provided the type of service that where animals shelters should be um, for animal services in today's age. Um, I was pleased to see as this study came back that we saw some different revenue opportunities that could come from doing this. So when we evolved to being more than just an animal control or animal jail, as it was characterized a couple of times, um, that there are opportunities to offset. So, you know, when you look at things and you say, well, if you do get actually do generate $200,000 a year and we calculate financing over that like we do on many businesses, you know, you know, I can finance a couple million dollars out of the equation for something like that. I also think they've looked at other areas where there could be some additional revenue opportunities that could come. So I don't see a project like this where it just becomes a net eight million dollar debt finance it and that's the end of the story and you know that's where we work from we would see those type of revenues that she identified others this is also a type of project where in planning it enough years out we'd be able to go after some grants or foundation money to come in for something like this because it is something that people are or there are more opportunities for than there are for things that are just traditional government services when we look at the, the services side of what's coming into this. So we do know it is time for us to make a change down there. So really it comes down to the point of we can build or add to go to a different services facility that is limited and doesn't do a lot more, just provides more space, but it's still the same type of facility or it's one that is, I will say, much more community friendly. And that's, that's what we're bringing back and we think that's the uh, probably the better direction for us to be looking to go. But I, I can make some additional comments later, but if you have questions for the team, um, leave it for that. Any questions? Commissioner Philbrook. Just a kind of a comment and a, and a question all rolled together. So I was just crunching some numbers and I'm not a good numbers person, so everybody can tell you that. Uh, I was looking at this and so the 8.4 million of, and I don't know how much it would cost us to finance this and the interest and all that on top of it, but um, so per year, at 50 years, if it really lasted that long, I'm just cost, um, flat would be 168,000, okay. So and then you look at that again and break it down to 14,000 per month and you think about how much would it cost if we were to actually lease from somebody else, not build our own, and all the other things that it would cost us. And for a time period, I mean, and plus they bring in, you know, the extra 202,000 if possible, you know, and our cost 168 per year, yeah, plus a few, and then of course, everything that we'd have to pay for anyway, which is employees and all that sort of thing. And in a way, it almost kind of pays for itself in some ways. So that's, yeah, and I hadn't seen this ahead of time, so I was like, okay, I gotta take a look at this and see because eight, you know, that amount of money to invest in my world is a lot of money. But then on the other hand, when we stop to consider the financial effect it has on our community about where people feel comfortable in living you know, who wants to run? I don't jog, obviously. But if I did, I wouldn't want to jog through an area that I had dogs nipping at my heels, dog running out to bite me or something like that. And there's a lot of people that complain or are concerned about their kids, and they don't want to let them 
play in their neighborhood because of those issues. So I, I'm definitely interested in going in this direction. Thank you. Comments or questions from the commissioners? Commissioner Walters. Um, so I didn't see any uh, evaluation of trying to reuse the existing facility. Uh, it's only 30 years old. It's really pretty new compared to most of the facilities that we have in this county. And, uh, you know, compare it to some of our fire stations, for example. And we could build a couple of fire stations for $8 million. So these are the kind of evaluations we'll have to do. So uh, was there an evaluation of trying to reuse any of the existing facility and um, not transform the program into this new direction? I'll, I'll take the first question. You know, if you said, yeah, we look, I mean, we looked at if the goals that are stated that we would like to get to, um, you know, with adoption services, renovating that, that facility. There's two couple things. It was built on a, a rock shelf, so the plumbing is very limited there. The so what we would have to do is to to do the infrastructure for the underground infrastructure. This I don't know if you know. Um, have been down there, but most of what we do with kennels kennels is. Uh, you have a continuous run of plumbing, so you have to restructure all the plumbing underneath the kennel. So we, we did look at that. The cost was um, at, at similar or more cost to mm -hmm. renovate. The other piece is if we had to add twice as much space, the, the grade and the limitations on the site, if you know it's very thin, most, most of the times we look for at least a two acre site. We have slightly less than two acres. I don't know if you're familiar with the site, it kind of rises up to the recycling area. So, and it's limited by the, uh, the ravine on the backside, which was the old railroad line. So to increase, try to increase the site um, to get, to recapture some of that land and ideal kind of situation where the, um, the uh, with a shelter as you try to build close to square, or, you know, because of the way things happen. Uh, as far as processing, so we did look at that. Um, you know, but we what we did was we assumed um, what the needs are for the, you know, as far as the quantity of animals and the type of care we're going to. So that's where we got to the square footage and putting that kind of square footage on that site is is very difficult to make it functional. So well, some of the questions that come to my mind just hearing this. Um, I'm trying to figure out where the public is served in a better way. And I, I don't know if the public is served in a better way if we do our adoptions versus PetSmart doing our adoptions for us. Um, what does the public care? Uh, and why would we want to get into that business if we have a good relationship with someone else? Those are some of the questions that came up to my mind. Secondly, why would we want to get into the retail business if our other retailers are doing it just fine? I don't think we want to do it in order to make money. Um, so um, seeing this for the first time, those are some of the questions that came to my mind. I'm really interested in how we can reduce the number of stray dogs in the county more than uh, any other priority. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Commissioner Townsend and then Commissioner Kane. Thank you. Good evening. A um, few questions. Uh, I appreciate this presentation. I'll have to get out to this facility and see it. Um, one of the slides, no kill uh, shelter status. What was the reason that we went from um, a kill, for lack of a better term, shelter? to a no-kill from, from 09 to 14? I, I think that just the industry standard and nationally, it, mm -hmm. there, there's um, a movement to not euthanize as many animals and um, making sure animals are spay and neutered so they're not reproducing. 
and we have enough animals as it is. So just working with um, the community instead of, you know, buying a new puppy every time you lose your puppy or your animal runs free, um, we're trying to get animals readopted. And in order to um, you know, have a no-kill shelter um, in that status, we can't euthanize animals, but we also don't have the space to hold them. So there's just a no-kill movement many years ago that um, has pushed, and it's a, a national trend. And it, so that, that's how we got to, to that point um, in early 2009. I've been with Animal Services for a year, so um, you know, this is all pretty new to me. I had heard the term no-kill shelter. I didn't know exactly what it meant. Um, but it's just getting, uh, making sure the community is aware and that there are animals that are adoptable. You don't have to go to a pet store and buy a new animal and keep breeding. Um, so it's just, you know, humane treatment for animals that really did nothing other than just have bad owners. Pro probably, Commissioner, one of the driving forces, just like Jennifer said, you know, raising awareness about the, the adoptability of animals. But it's probably the relationships that we established with some of the uh, nonprofit organizations. We were able to trans start transferring more animals out, and that became a priority for animal services. So when we started transferring out these organizations that do do the adoptions, they did it much more efficiently than we could based on our current uh, facility at animal services. Okay, thank you. So, okay, I understand. Uh, another question on the slide where we talked about potential revenue. A proposed fee increase for dogs is, was $150, cats 50 What are the current fees for a dog and a cat? The current fees for male dogs is 62 It's just their surgeries are easier. Mm -hmm. um, female dogs is 72 and cats are 35 Currently. So we are pretty low by just um, the surrounding area. We're, we're very low on our adoption fees. And those would be the fees that, say, if I wanted to come in and adopt a, a dog that I would pay? Yes. Okay. yes. Uh, last question. The, what, what is the daily cost on average of just maintaining a dog or a cat at the shelter currently? Hmm. Um, that is that I would have to look into that because I honestly I, d I don't know what the cost is um, Animals can be there anywhere from a day or they can be we have animals that are there over 30 days um, They all get food, you know, they all get water whatever medications they need a lot of them aren't healthy when they come in mm -hmm. um, So it varies, but that's definitely something that I could look into and find out mm -hmm. I'd appreciate it, yeah, because you were, I realize not not all of the animals come in with the same needs and with the same status, but over time, since we're, we are no-kill, I, I would be curious to know what just the average cost for a okay. dog, cat. Last thing, <laughs> the last uh, shot is so adorable. It reminds me of the ones I see at 3 o'clock in the morning when you got set. <laughs> Are those actually animals that were adopted through our shelter or? Yes. Really? Yep. Okay. Yep. They were turned, brought in as strays and? Um, I, I don't remember all the, I just know the poodle is oodles of noodles. Okay. Um, so um, all three of them were actually adopted, yes. Okay. So True. every animal that's pictured in here came mm -hmm. from our shelter. Truth and advertising. Okay, yep. thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Kane. Before we spend, uh, I don't want to poo on your presentation, but before we spend this kind of money, I think we need a police substation in Quindaro. Mm -hmm. We need to build a fire station out west. We need to build a combination of police and fire stations together. That's a lot of money. We could build a lot of other things besides that. And I think that location, as Jim brought up, I think you could expand it a, a little bit, you know, and stay where you're at and, and do some work there with like a Morton building hooked up to it or something. But, uh, we don't have the money to do this and all the other things we want to do. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? 
Um, just want to thank the uh, chief and your commanders and Jennifer Stewart and your team at the Animal Services Division because um, you've been transforming the work of this division for a couple years now. Um, and it is transformational and is changing the landscape of the community. And you've gone out and found these incredible partners, nonprofit partners in the community to come together and collaborate on programming that is dealing head on with our community cats and dogs problem, just to name one thing they're handling. Um, so I just wanna commend you on the work that you've done so far. I wanna also thank you for going to work every day in this building because it's a pretty sad place and you have to have a lot of stamina just to show up for work every day. So I really appreciate it and I mean it sincerely. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Mr. Bach. I just, and I think this is in line with where Commissioner Kane was. The, the intention of tonight's presentation was to bring back where we were after we went did did the study. Um, that was the direction we had to come forward, show what we could do, show really the order of magnitude, look at the existing site so that analysis was done with it. Um, so it's a big project, but it is one that in the end we compare and bring back in comparison to all the other projects we have in line. So it's not like we usually jump in and say, well, here's a new $8 million project, let's do it next month. and and move so we will start to if this is the direction you know we want to move toward this in future years it is a comparison it comes right now it would be a future project if we want to do it that falls into our unfunded projects and then we determine whether or not we want to put it in funding in out years and and work on it from there so that's that's what we want to come back and give you tonight and then let you prioritize it as as you deem appropriate when we look at future funding and future options. Melissa. Commissioner Philbrook. I want um, the volunteers and the organizations that have been working very hard with you to understand that don't give up, keep working with us. There is light at the end of the tunnel somewhere. You know, and I know that they've really been wanting us to do a lot more on our end, put money where our mouths are as far as helping with the animal control issues and taking care of the animals. Um, I'm only one commissioner, okay? But I still understand the plight and the problem with it, and we do only have so much money. But that doesn't mean we can't work, work together to try to find maybe other ways to get things done. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, anyone else? If not, that concludes this meeting. Uh, we are adjourned until our 7 p.m. meeting, which we will meet in the commission chambers downstairs. Thank you. <laughs>